Welcome to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Nicholson, here with bite-sized episodes to empower, educate, and enlighten you with ways to lose weight, heal your gut, and achieve your ideal health so you can live an adventure-filled life. Let's dive in. Welcome back to the Holistic Health Bites podcast and the Metabolic Health series. Today we are talking all about cancer. This one generally catches people off guard because most people think cancer is either genetic, toxin related, or just totally random. While genetics and toxins do play a role, cancer is a metabolic disease. So let's back up a little bit and talk more generally about cancer first, and then we'll come back to the metabolic side of things and some strategies that you can use to boost your immune functioning and reduce your risk of cancer growth. So cancer is the second leading cause of death in the U.S., though it's striving to overtake heart disease in the number one spot. Cancer can develop in any tissue of the body with breast and prostate leading the way in women and men respectively, and lung cancer being the most deadly. Cancer is basically the uncontrolled division of abnormal cells and can include the spread of those cells throughout the body. There are often genetic mutations included, but when scientists have looked closer at the genetics, most cancers aren't truly genetic in origin. Sure, there are some mutations that many of us carry that can put us at an increased risk, which is not the same thing as guaranteed to get cancer, but there are hundreds or even thousands of mutations that can occur within a single tumor that weren't necessarily present in the original healthy cells. So this also means that there won't be a genetic answer to most kinds of cancer. Newer research is finding that all cancers are in fact a disease of energy metabolism or a metabolic disease. So let's break that down a little bit. All cancers, regardless of the tissue type or the location in the body, use fermentation for energy generation. This is an anaerobic process, meaning it doesn't use oxygen, like the majority of our cells that use oxidative phosphorylation for energy production, meaning oxygen is used. Most of our energy production also occurs inside of the mitochondria, and the anaerobic process of fermentation or glycolysis actually occurs outside of the mitochondria. Now, this fermentation pathway uses sugar as the primary fuel, and this is where nutrition can play a major role in helping cancer grow or helping the body fight off cancer growth. If you've read any scientific literature or books on this topic, you will often hear this referred to as the Warburg effect, after Dr. Otto Warburg, who identified this pathway in the 1920s, a hundred years ago, they knew that sugar was driving cancer. Now, a side note, this is exactly how PET scans work. If you've ever known anyone undergoing cancer treatment or being monitored during remission, you've likely heard people undergoing PET scans to detect active cancers. The way that a PET scan works is they give the patient radioactively labeled sugar that can then be tracked throughout the body. Where the radioactivity accumulates, cancer is present, sucking up all of that sugar for its fermentation process cancer thrives on sugar. So if cancer thrives on sugar, wouldn't it seem logical that reducing or eliminating as much sugar as possible would help reduce cancer's ability to grow? I sure think so, but let's take this a little bit further. We've talked a lot on this show about insulin resistance and the fact that it is primarily developing due to consumption of high amounts of carbohydrates over a long period of time. Insulin resistance also causes high levels of insulin to be present. And insulin is a growth and storage hormone. 
This means that it also drives cancer cells to grow even faster. So if you're consuming high levels of carbohydrates and therefore have higher amounts of sugar in your blood, you will have both the food that cancer's thriving on and the hormone that's making it grow faster. A double whammy. And statistics prove that regardless of body weight, people with insulin resistance have twice the likelihood of dying from cancer. So let's talk about the link between a few of the most relevant cancers and insulin resistance. Now we're only going to talk about a couple different kinds of cancers, but this does apply to most cancers. In breast cancer, women with the highest fasting insulin levels succumb to the worst breast cancer outcomes. This is because the average breast cancer cell has six times the amount of insulin receptors than the non-cancerous breast tissue in the same breast. This means that the cancer cells are able to take up this powerful growth factor faster than the surrounding healthy tissues. Researchers have consistently found that controlling insulin resistance helps control breast cancer. In prostate cancer, men with insulin resistance are two to three times more likely to have an enlarged prostate. In fact, men with a high degree of insulin resistance may be 250% more likely to develop prostate cancer than insulin sensitive men of the same age, race, and body weight. Again, it's because these cancer cells have increased insulin receptors on their cells, just like breast cancer tissue, increasing the growth signals for the cancer. And colorectal cancer is another common cancer with a major connection to insulin resistance. And insulin resistance makes this type of cancer three times more deadly. Insulin resistance is the reason why so many cancers seem to come out of nowhere. Insulin resistance doesn't have any overt symptoms of its own, but it's often a component of many other disorders that do have symptoms, like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, migraines, cognitive decline, and even infertility. This insulin resistance can silently develop over decades, all the while increasing your risk of cancer as well. So now that we know these things about cancer, what can we do to prevent cancer and or increase the likelihood of survival if you do have cancer? Well, nutrition is foundational to all of health. We can't ignore the need for a quality, nutrient-dense diet. Now, within this category, we also want to restore insulin sensitivity or reverse insulin resistance. This means we need to eliminate simple carbohydrates like sweets and sweet beverages. We also need to reduce overall carbohydrate intake. How much you need to reduce your carbohydrate intake depends a lot on you. How insulin resistant are you? Do you have a diagnosed metabolic disorder? Are you overweight or obese? What else is going on with your health, symptoms, and your history? This is why I always recommend that you work with a functionally trained practitioner like me who can help assess all of these factors and help you implement a healing protocol that's appropriate for you. Within this healthy diet, we also need to ensure that you're getting adequate quality proteins and healthy fats, not taking in excess toxins or artificial ingredients. Now, secondarily to nutrition is fasting. This is a tremendously valuable tactic for overall health benefits. This one might sound counter to what you will hear from conventional medical models that will tell you when you're going through cancer that you can't afford to lose any weight. And so therefore you should focus on eating anything and everything that you possibly can, even if that's milkshakes, to maintain your weight. They say this because when you're going through traditional chemo or radiation treatments, many patients will lose excessive amounts of weight, including lean muscle and bone tissue. This is a process called cachexia. 
This is a metabolic, not a calorie driven process though. Someone already in a cachexic state will likely not respond to simply increasing calories. This is because the process of cachexia slows down protein synthesis and increases protein breakdown. So you're making proteins in a slower fashion and you're breaking down proteins much faster than normal. So this is why quality protein intake is so vital. Following the standard advice to just simply just eat more of anything you possibly can, including milkshakes, will increase your blood sugar and insulin, driving inflammation and cancer growth, while not providing the building blocks that you actually need. A low glycemic ketogenic diet will instead help to reduce tumor growth and proliferation and prevent cachexia. So how does fasting plan? Weight loss can be harmful if it's due to cachexia, but it can also be therapeutic and therefore helpful when done correctly. Fasting can increase the likelihood of the weight loss being therapeutic by further reducing insulin, reducing inflammation, allowing the body to repair and restore and to just help everything reset and rest. It sounds counterintuitive, but fasting actually helps preserve muscle tissue. We can actually determine if the weight loss is healthy or cachexic through proper laboratory testing so that we'll know for sure which type of weight loss you are currently undergoing. Now, speaking of testing, this is also vital to really understanding all of the imbalances that are playing into your personal metabolic dysfunction. This type of testing can tell us if you have nutrient deficiencies, inflammation, chronic infections, toxins, detoxification issues, digestive issues, or immune system problems that are increasing your risks of being able to effectively fight off cancers that develop. Cancers are developing in us all of the time, in all of us, but healthy bodies can effectively kill them off when they're only a few cells in size before you ever even knew you had it. If you have any of these kinds of imbalances though, you might not be able to detect or fight off the development quickly enough before it grows out of control. Now beyond nutrition and testing, we also need to optimize stress handling, sleep quality and quantity, overall toxin and trauma exposure, and ensure that you're getting adequate exercise. So I do want to take a second here and mention trauma. Numerous studies have shown that all chronic diseases are worsened and often not well treated when the patient has unresolved trauma in their past life or in their present life. This is a critical step that isn't often spoken about, but you will not heal properly if you haven't dealt with those demons. I urge you, even if past issues don't seem to bother you on a daily basis, if you've never fully dealt with them, they are holding you back and potentially causing disease. So deal with them. I also recommend that you take the ACE quiz. Simply do an internet search for the Adverse Childhood Events Quiz and see how many of those types of events you went through as a child that could be impacting your health now. Deal with any that you find on that list with a qualified mental health professional. I'm personally a big fan of EMDR training because it requires less verbalization of the issue. I've always struggled to really put past issues into words, so talk therapy didn't really work for me, but EMDR made a tremendous difference for me. So I urge you to try to find the right kind of training and therapy for you. Now, if you do have cancer or a history of cancer, just know that there are tons of treatment options. These dietary approaches aren't necessarily going to cure you, 
though they can help your body fight the cancer naturally. And of course, there are case studies of full remission through diet and lifestyle only. But these can also be tremendously valuable in more conventional treatments and even other holistic or natural treatments. I highly encourage you to talk to a lot of different professionals with various methods so that you can choose what's best for you. It's your journey. Don't let the practitioner make the decisions for you. Ask questions, get second opinions, get third opinions, read books, listen to podcasts, choose what's best for you and implement these diet and lifestyle strategies along with whatever treatment you choose to help you feel your best throughout the process. Cancer is a big, scary topic that has touched nearly every one of us. Sadly, the conventional medical model provides some frankly dangerous advice. I personally see this poor advice being given to my own family members undergoing cancer treatment. I was recently at the hospital with a family member who was having a surgery to replace a bile duct stent related to a pancreatic tumor he has. Following the surgery, the medical staff gave him jello and soda to ease him back into eating foods. They recommended these clear fluids to help his body adjust to eating again after this surgery. This patient currently has wildly high blood sugar levels and is currently taking insulin because of the pancreatic tumor suppressing his own insulin production. And they gave him sugar, pure sugar to a man in his 80s with extremely elevated blood sugars and an active cancer while also on chemo for cancer. They're literally fueling the fire of cancer right before my eyes. It just breaks my heart. Some people aren't ready to hear it or don't want to question the conventional medical providers, though. I know that isn't you or you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be listening to this. And I thank you for that. Thank you for listening and helping to spread the word of this valuable information. If we can help even one person improve their lives, it's all worth it. If you would like to learn more about cancer and its metabolic dysfunctions, I highly recommend you check out these three experts, and they'll probably spur you to look up even more. Dr. Nasha Winters, who also wrote the book called Metabolic Approach to Cancer. Dr. Jason Fung, who wrote several books on fasting and metabolic dysfunction to include The Cancer Code. And Dr. Thomas Seyfried, who wrote a very technical book called The Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. This one may be a little too technical for the average reader, but his information is solid. All three of these experts also have numerous videos online that walk through various aspects of these principles. And lastly, if you'd like to explore working with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can reach out for a complimentary consultation, and let's discuss what's going on with you. Next week, I'll be back with another metabolic health episode talking all about hormone imbalances and conditions. Until then, be well and vibrant. Thanks for being a faithful listener to the podcast. I'd love it if you left me a five-star review on this podcast so that others can more easily find this valuable information. Did you know I also work one-on-one -on -one with clients? I approach solving health challenges like I approached solving crimes by conducting a thorough investigation into your case. Whether you're looking to lose weight, boost your energy, fix your digestive system, or reduce inflammation, I can help. All you have to do to get started is book a free call. The link is in the show notes.